Look, everyone, July might be the most boring month in the calendar, but there is a glimmer of hope because in less than 50 days, the NFL regular season will be upon us. And as veterans made their way into Henderson to start training camp for the Las Vegas Raiders, we are joined by national NFL writer from Bleacher Report, Sports Knot, and co-host of the new official Odyssey podcast that covers the Raiders, Silver and Black Today. Mo Moten joins us now. Mo, I've been trying to get you on the show for a minute. I'm excited. Welcome to the show. How are you? My apologies, Adrian. Uh, quick side story. I actually looked at my DMs right when we were <laughs> linking up, and I was like, man, I was such a douchebag. I ignored some of his uh, messages. Uh, just full disclosure, sometimes I get flooded in my DMs, so I'm sorry. My apologies about that. First, Mo, you're popping. You got like 25,000 <laughs> followers, 25K. I understand the DMs get flooded, so I'm glad we're here in this moment. And as always, all insider calls mm-hmm. are brought to us by BetQL. Bet smarter and beat the books. Download your BetQL app today or go to BetQL.com. So, Mo, uh, let's start off. With the new regime, McDaniels and Ziegler, of course, they've had an offseason. They've had a draft to make some moves. What are your early offseason impressions? Well, it's funny because when the offseason first started off, the Chargers made some moves. Brian Khalil Mack, they signed J.C. Jackson, the Broncos acquired Russell Wilson, and the Raider fans were like, what are the Raiders doing? You know, wait, you know, wake up. <laughs> Dave Ziegler asleep at the wheel. And once he started to make moves, you started to see what the plan was, and, and you can see that the Raiders are now in win-now mode. I also I also noticed that what they're trying to do is establish a winning culture. You're bringing in Chandler Jones. He comes from the Patriots, Patriots roots. Of course, Devonta Adams did a lot of winning with the Packers and Aaron Rodgers. So they're serious about competing in the AFC West. A lot of people wondering, were they going to reload and kind of not re, not start over, but kind of reset? Uh, there were questions about whether they're going to bring back Derek Carr or not. And I, I wasn't really too concerned with that. Um, the reports were out that Josh McDaniels actually wanted Carr when he was in uh, when McDaniels was in New England. So new Carr would be in place. I did not see the Devontae Adams trade happening. Didn't see Chandler Jones. Those two moves snuck up on me. But the Raiders are operating as a very sleek stealth uh, organization right now with McDaniels and Ziegler at the helm. And as I said at the beginning of, of this diatribe, they're they're in win they're operating in win now mode. You bring in Devontae Adams, you bring in Chandler Jones, you extend your cornerstone guys because you're competing for a Super Bowl title. And I was going to ask you a little bit later here in the interview, but I'll do it right now because because you bring up those expectations. And, you know, the, the team hits the field tomorrow. Today, the veterans did a press conference and a running theme was kind of how they were going to manage expectations because they're there from us here in the media, from fans and people around the league. So my question to you, Mo, is how long of a grace period do you think Josh McDaniels is going to have with all this talent, all these resources and expectations for this Raiders team? Adrian, it's funny you asked me that because someone on Twitter actually tweeted at me and said, if the Raiders don't make the playoffs, does Josh McDaniels walk the plank? And I'm like, whoa, 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 let's hit the brakes. Pause for a minute. You know, it's a I different era Raiders, now. <laughs> <laughs> right. I understand the Raiders don't make the playoffs. It's disappointing. But remember, the Raiders were in a bit of a mess over the past decade because they had so much instability. It wouldn't make any sense to go back into a cycle of instability. So with that said, I would say you got to give it two years to see their, their plan fully flush out. Now, of course, I'm expecting the Raiders to compete and get a playoff spot this year. And as I just said, the, the expectations should be Super Bowl title or bust. But I understand progress. I understand sometimes things take time to uh, flesh out and pan out. Uh, but the Raiders are in a division where if they don't compete for a title, they're going to get lapped by the Chargers, by the Broncos, by the Chiefs. So by default, this is, this, is, this is a team that doesn't have a lot of time, as I just said, with the extensions and the guys they brought in. You know, Shayla Jones not exactly in the prime of his career. People have already been saying, well, what if Devontae Adams starts to fall off after 30? You know, these guys aren't, aren't in their young tw- early 20s. So – the time to win is right now, but I would give it two years before I would see it fully fleshed out on the field. And, and I think with training camp kicking off tomorrow officially with everyone hitting the field, that's probably one of the more interesting parts of what McDaniels and Ziegler and kind of this regime is that we finally get to see they haven't talked a lot. They have spoke, but we'll get to see what they really think by the tandems and who's getting the first reps and who's getting the second reps. And something that I thought was interesting in your answer that you just said was the term stability. Another huge thing that happened in the offseason and happened a couple weeks ago. Raiders get a new president, the third president in a very short time period. Historic hire in Sandra Douglas Morgan, hometown hero, first black woman to hold the position in NFL history. And I asked your co-host on Silver and Black today, 
by the way, available on the Odyssey app now. And I'm going to ask you right now, Mo, do you think Sandra is going to bring stability and do you believe she will have the support to make changes? Well, I hope she does bring stability because, as you just mentioned, it was the 13th president, I believe, a year or so. So uh, that she addressed, she kind of addressed that in her presser. She said, you know, there are, you know, basically I'm paraphrasing here, but she basically said, you know, there are things to clean up because there's been a lot of turnover in the Raiders front office over the past year. A lot going on in the front office, but people wondering what's going on. So it's going to be her job, in a sense, to, to get the broom and kind of clean that up. But I think she's, she is going to have the support of that organization behind her because the Raiders have been, let's be honest, the Raiders have been in the press for a lot of negative reasons. So at this point in time, you bring in the first black female president, team president in the NFL, She's going to get the support and she, for Mark Davis and that organization, and they're going to hope to turn things around at the top because sometimes people feel like if you're if you're a mess at the top, it has a way of trickling down the field. So you want to be top to bottom. You want to be a buttoned-up organization. No, absolutely. And last night she was actually at the Aces game sitting next to Mark Davis. Uh, she seemed excited. She was very, mm-hmm. you know, very energetic and looking forward to everything. That that was the one thing that I, I took away from today going to the facility is that that excitement and that energy was palpable mm-hmm. throughout the arena or throughout the, uh, the facility. But let's get into some actual on-the-field things as training camp kicks off. Last year, red zone scoring was a problem. You pick up arguably the best wide receiver in the game. Derek Carr, Hunter Renfro, Josh Jacobs, Darren Waller, all these pieces. How dynamic do you think this offense is going to be? Well, first of all, the offense should be top five in scoring. Uh, I mean, top ten maybe they were the most realistic uh, expectation, but I believe it can get to top five with the pieces you just mentioned. Derek Carr, Hunter Renfro, Darren Waller all have a rapport ready. Uh, as we know, Devontae and Derek Carr played at Fresno State together, so they have a working relationship, and they've also worked out together in the offseason. And the sirens are going off because, as you can see, the Raiders are that popular that the sirens <laughs> have to go off while I'm talking about their offense. But, um, yeah, I, I think this offense should click well. And I believe eight of the top ten top-scoring teams last year made the playoffs. So if the Raiders are in that top ten, I think they could be top five. If they're in that top ten, they'll be in good company. The, the big question is, for those pieces to fit in place and for Derek Carr to get the ball to those pieces, the offensive line has to be a lot better than it was last year. No, and that's 100% facts. And that's that, to me, is it your key? Is that the biggest, the biggest thing that fans should be looking out for in training camp? Is it going to be the secondary or the offensive line to you? Ah, you, you, so you must have took a look at my notes before I got on here. Those are the two things that I'm looking at. How will the offensive line pan out, specifically the right side of the offensive line? Because I believe Colton Miller at left tackle, John Simpson probably at left guard, and Andre James at center. I believe those guys are set, not guaranteed, except for Colton Miller, but I believe the other two younger guys are going to be set on that side of the line. Where is Alex Leather going to play? Is it going to be right tackle? Is it going to be right guard? Because he's going to get reps at both positions. So that's something to look out for. And how does he progress? Because Alex Leatherwood, I think, is the key there. Because if he isn't, if he doesn't progress, the Raiders are going to have a big problem because they're going to have holes at two positions on, on the offensive line instead of one. Denzel Good coming back off of a torn ACL at 31 years old. Eh, we'll see. I think he could be a surprise cut. Some people may disagree with that. Oh, wow. But you mentioned the secondary. The secondary is what I've been harping on. A lot. And I actually have a, a piece coming out on Sports Night coming soon uh, because there was news about Trayvon Mullen. And, you know, he had his foot surgery in May. Big Taper at the Athletics said of the three guys that are on the pup list, that's Bilal Nichols, Jonathan Hankins, and Trayvon Mullen, the Raiders are most concerned about Trayvon Mullen of the three. Not to say that he's going to be out for an extended period, but of those three guys, they're most concerned with him. And if he's out, then that means Rocky Asin, who they acquired in the Yannick Ngakwe trade from the Colts, and Anthony Avery could both play a lot of reps. Also, it was said that Amik Robinson had a lot of reps on the outside during the spring. And, and also, that's that's two. He had surgery on his foot, right? That's correct. So that's two Maybe. foot surgeries in like less than a year or around a year, correct? I, I, I believe. But here's the thing with Mullen. And a lot of people are saying that he's injury prone. I, would, I won't buy that narrative yet. But it is concerning that you battled the foot injury during the season, I believe, as you, as you mentioned, had a procedure, and then had a, had a procedure in May. So he downplayed it on Twitter. He said he had successful surgery not to worry about it. He'll be back stronger than ever, as players usually say. But now he's on the pump list, and I understand with the surgery, you got to give it some time. Maybe they just don't want to rush him. They don't want to push him and have him re-injure that foot. They want to make sure he's ready. But that is a position, the cornerback position, the secondary specifically, is something to just keep an eye on because – they did, again, they brought in Rocky Austin, Anthony Avery, Darius Phillips. 
Amik Robinson still hovering on the roster. We could see some some changes in the on the back end of that of that uh, defense this year. And one person that that I'm going to have an eye out on this uh, this upcoming season is Josh Jacobs. Obviously, it's a contract year for him, but also. Raiders, you talk about those New England ties. They brought in, they brought in Brandon Bolden. They drafted Zamir White, Kenyon Drake coming back from injury. It's a crowded running back room, and obviously a lot of it, and I think a lot of bad habits developed because of how poor that offensive line played. But how much of an impact do you see Josh Jacobs having here in 2022? I think he'll be the feature back. I don't think he's going to get 200-plus carries as he did in his first few years. I think he'll be in that 175, 190 range. He'll be about 900 rushing yards. Kind of like what Damian Harris has been for the Patriots in the past few years. May get a lot of touchdowns, but not a lot of value as far as his rushing yards. Because as you mentioned, it's a crowded running back room. He's got a split carries with Kenyon Drake, Brandon Bowman, who I believe is going to get touches more as a receiver. But then they also drafted Zemir White, who I think is going to get a lot of run late in the season because I think they're going to want to take a look at him as a feature back before 2023 when he probably will be the feature back because I don't see Jacobs back with the Raiders, whether he performs well or not. Because he's, if he performs well, he could price his way out of Las Vegas where Justin Jones says, I'm not going to pay, even though he played well. And if he underperforms, then it's like, okay, we, we're justified in, in moving on with Zemir White. So for Josh Jacobs, I think is whether he does well or does or underperforms, he's going he, he's gonna to be on the outs, and you're going to see Zemir White taking a lot of carries next year. Mo Mo and joining us here on The Playmakers. He is also – with Bleacher Report and his new podcast, an Odyssey original, Silver and Black. Today, of course, you can get that on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast. And be sure to follow Mo on Twitter, at Mo Moten. My last Raiders question before we get into your predictions uh, article that you put up, uh, on Bleacher Report going through all 32 teams. But on the opposite side of the ball for the Raiders on defense, obviously we got the edge rushers and Chandler Jones and Max Crosby, but do you see the Raiders adding a defensive tackle? And not even necessarily, but I know fans have dreams of the Dominican Sue, but do you see them adding some, uh, some more to the depth of that defensive line? That's a good question. As you said, a lot of people are going to say, well, they're going to whisper, Dominican Sue is the guy. He's going to cost a lot. And Dominican Sue has always been about his, his money. And if you're going to bring him in, you're going to, you're going to probably play, pay a premium dollar. And I don't know if the Rays want to do that at a non-premium position. But I could definitely see them bringing in another guy if Jonathan Hankins has an extended sale on the pub list. Now, Neil Farrell Jr., who they drafted in the fourth round, I believe, is Hankins' replacement. But if there's an injury there, again, if Blau Nichols and, and or Hankins are on the pub list, I could see them bringing in another guy. That D-line because it is a new interior D-line. As you mentioned, we already know about Max Crosby and Chandler Jones on the outside. Cleveland Farrell, I think, will float between the D-line and on the edge, but you might want to bring in some depth there just to, just to have a plan B, just in case of injury. And uh, I just gave out your Twitter, at Momo, and if you go on your Twitter, the pin tweet is the article mm-hmm. we're about to get into for Bleacher Report. So you went through all 32 teams uh, and kind of predicted their record for the upcoming season. So I want to get your surprise contender as you went through the league and was looking at everything. So I want to get your surprise consent contender on one side and the surprise disappointment team of this upcoming season. Ooh, surprise contender. Oh, getting into that. I, you know what? I, not to say that they'll make the playoffs, but there are actually two teams. Well, I'll go with one and I'll say, I think the Detroit Lions are going to be a surprise team this year. What? Simply because, yes, a lot of people are down on Jared Goff, but he has some weapons around him. Amon Ryan St. Brown had a really good rookie year, a lot of, a fourth rounder. A lot of people didn't see that coming. They have uh, DeAndre Swift back there. They have Jamal Williams. They have some running backs, and I really love what they did with their defense. Aiden Hutchinson is coming in. Uh, they got a couple of guys who can move from the D-line on, and on the edge, so they have versatile up front. Uh, they got a cornerback on the back end, a warrior who played well last year. So they have some pieces all over that roster, and I think they're going to be a huge, huge surprise. Now, as far as a disappointment, I would have to go with the Tennessee Titans. And I and a lot of people have railed against me for this, but Derrick Henry kind of reminds me of what Christian McCaffrey was after the 2019 season. He, had, he led the league in touches, had a 403, I believe. Then he just couldn't stay healthy. Now, Derrick Henry, one injury, has a foot injury. But when you're a big guy, at least he's 6'3", 247, and you have, once you start having foot problems, that's a red flag. That could be a, a lingering problem. And we all know that that offense has been on his back. He's been the engine of that offense. And Ryan Tannehill regressed once his former offensive coordinator, Arthur Smith, 
is went to be the coach of the Atlanta Falcons. So he regressed. Your, your running back is coming off an injury. I have major, major questions about the Tennessee Titans this year. Yeah, and I know Tannehill's getting paid a stack. And I, I wanted to look this up as you were saying this with the Detroit Lions because I know they're on hard knocks next year. And I'm looking through the history. I wanted to see the record of the team that was on hard knocks and how they did that season. It's been bad, but in 2010, the Jets won 11-5. 2009, the Bengals won 10-6. and So there is some hope for the Detroit Lions. Um, I need some advice or, or actually, I want to get your philosophy. Because like I said, I was at training camp today in the press conference. And it was my first time being in that press conference room with uh, all the other media members asking questions to Max Crosby, the stand and the third. And I noticed, and I'm not going to say any names, uh, there was one gentleman who kind of went with the approach of asking the same question to each player. Is that your approach personally, or do you like to mix it up? I like to mix it up. I, I know exactly who you're referring to. Oh, but Jesus. I, I, it, 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 it's, definitely, it's definitely a tactic for some media members because they're hoping to get a different answer from different people and, and just kind of compare. I like to mix it up simply because you got You have to kind of get a feel for each player. Some players like to talk, like a Denzel Perryman. I believe he's he's going to be great with the media, and some players don't say much. And I think that's become Jonathan Abram. I saw a recent presser with Jonathan Abram, and he and he went from as a rookie very talkative, and now he's very tight lipped. Things done so changed, a, <laughs> right? And because he, he's under a lot of pressure this year, and that's something I didn't mention with Deron Harmon on the roster. He may not be the starter come week one. We'll see. But with as far as questioning players, you have to get a feel for the player and then ask accordingly. If if I was in front of Denzel Perriman, I I would just ask as much as I can. Of course, they can't give out the X's and O's, but I would try my best to get something out of it. Well, they were asking about his bank account and his contract, and he was like, "Nope, nope, 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 <laughs> nope, nope. I'm here for football." <laughs> hey, uh, Mo, we appreciate the time. I got two more questions before we get you out of mm-hmm. here. First and foremost, no when's the next podcast coming out, and what's gonna be on it? Next podcast dropping will be on Thursday with me and Scott, Scott Gobranson, LV Gully on Twitter. We're going to break down the wide receiver room. We're going to break down the tight end room. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of Foster Moreau because a lot of there's a split within the fan base. A lot of people are very high on Foster Moreau because they think he could be a starter at some point. And there are some people who say, well, he's been disappointing because of the expectations. When uh, after Jason Winton was gone, they figured he would, he would blossom while Darren Waller was hurt. Didn't really happen. He had some bright moments, but just underwhelmed in a sense, but we're going to really get into that. And who's going to be that outside wide receiver uh, that's in three wide receiver sets with Hunter Renfro and Devontae Adams? I have a direct answer for that. I think I'm pretty on point with it, but we'll, we'll see. OBJ? You know what? <laughs> a lot of fans you know are listening for that. This is the tease. You go on the Odyssey app and you listen and you find out. And before we get you out of here, so one of the taglines here on the Playmakers, and Lindsay is not here with us today, but she will be in the future because we look forward to having you on here um, throughout the season, sincerely. But it's sports and other things, you know what I'm saying? So just to get to know you, I want to know, what's the album or TV show or movie that you're binging through or listening to right now? Album or TV show that I'm binging through? Wow, you, I, this is going to be a revelation. I, people who know me personally know this. I don't watch a lot of TV. A lot of people are on Stranger Things and all of this other stuff. I'm a more of an old school hip hop fan, so I'm listening to a lot of the stuff that I used to have on my MP3 player. No, this is perfect. On my CD. Damn. I, I'm not into the. No. I'm not into the. I, by the way, I'm 36 years old, so I can speak like this. But I'm not into the new school mumble. Oh, rap that's Jesus. going on. It's just. It's just not my thing. I can't even keep up with who's rapping. I'm out here in New York City, so. If you're familiar with it, there's a lot of drill rap going on out here. It's just not my not Re- my thing. But. Rest in peace to Pop Smoke. I'm very yeah. disappointed. The way you said I'm listening to my MP3 player like it's a Walkman, <laughs> like it's a Walkman, <laughs> made me super disappointed. I will make sure the instrumental going into this interview is some Nas just for you, Mo. Uh, we appreciate, I appreciate you. That. <laughs> no, and I appreciate you. Thank you for all the time, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, Mo. Thanks for having me, and shout out to Lindsey, who I'll, I'm sure I'll talk to in the near future. Yes, sir. There he is, Mo Moten from Bleacher Report, from Sports Not, national NFL writer. And, of course, he is a part of the brand-new podcast on the Odyssey umbrella, an Odyssey original, Silver and Black today. Be sure to follow him at Mo Moten. It's the Playmakers on a Wednesday. We got to close out the show by... 
Looking back at it, 